We are here in conversation with Chris Harris, who is sheltering in Coralville and is in the uh, Cinematic Arts Department, and Rebecca Fons, uh, who is sheltering in Chicago. What neighborhood are you in, Rebecca? I'm in the Old Town neighborhood, Old Town of Chicago. Yeah. Okay, great. Good restaurants there. That sounds yes. lovely. <laughs> and um, Rebecca is the programming director at Film Scene and um, also a graduate of the Cinematic Arts um, Department at the University of Iowa. And um, so we're going to talk today about what is going on in the world of cinema. And um, Rebecca, uh, I'm hoping that you can start us off. I think everybody, there is such total fondness for film scene and its recent opening. And um, so maybe just tell us a little bit about what's happening with film scene, but then expand because of your traveling so much, you've got your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the cycle of movie making. Just let us kind of give us a sense of what sure. is happening. Sure. So film scene uh, shuttered both of our locations on March 16th. I think it was 15. Um, and you know, that felt like a really monumental move. But by the end of that week, every single cinema in the entire country had shuttered as well. Um, from the large chains like AMC and even Marcus and Iowa City um, to independent cinemas like Film Scene and, and other independent and other art house cinemas from New York to California. Um, and they've been closed since. Um, there are a few movie theaters that are opening, starting to reopen, which I can get into. But um, I mean, it was a huge decision. It was something that we labored over. I mean, obviously it seems like it was, there was no other decision to make. As, as many hours as we spent figuring out what to do about the closure, now it's, you know, 10 weeks on. It's just sort of like, you know, there's no way we wouldn't have closed. Um, and, uh, you know, because film scene prides itself on being a 365 days a year cinema and we had never closed since our, our opening, you know, about six years ago, we had never closed. Um, and so it was, it was a big move and, you know, with two locations and something like 25 staff members and 10 salaried staff members and it was, it was a huge blow. Um, but of course, after we closed, we, we've been spending this time working on engaging with the community in, in the virtual world, which is like incredibly challenging. Uh, it's, it's very like antithetical to what we do to encourage people to stay home and watch movies on their couch. That's like the opposite of what we want to do usually. Um, but figuring out ways to still engage movie lovers and cinephiles and film scene members and patrons virtually has been like this huge, I mean, I've never wanted to learn how to do that. And now I know how to do it, which is a weird experience. Um, and, and, you know, so the, the ripple effect, the seismic um, shift in, in the film industry in the United States and nationally, internationally, excuse me, um, is beyond anything I would have ever expected in my, my wildest nightmares, because, you know, every cinema closing meant that every film distributor from Paramount and, you know, Walt Disney Pictures to smaller distributors like Kino Lorber and A24 and Neon, all of their demand was gone. I mean, every single cinema closed, which means any movie that they were showing uh, was stopping. And then any movie that was coming out was no longer going to be released. So there's a husband walking through the frame, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so you know, every distributor immediately started moving their release dates. So, you know, if a movie was coming out in March, end of March, all of April, all of May, all of June, those four months were completely, the deck was completely cleared and all of those films were either put on ice indefinitely or they were moved to later in the year. That, and that's everything from like Mulan, the big Disney tentpole title, summer title, to small films like the new Kelly Reichardt film, First Cow, which had just opened in New York and LA and then they, they, they pulled it and now it's being shelved for a while. Um, which means that just the supply chain has been completely cut off. The, the, de the demand has been completely cut off. So there's just been shifting sands incredibly under our feet to figure out not only on, on a health and safety level when we can reopen, then figuring out what that means to reopen and then figuring out what to show when we reopen because there isn't a new movie to show. I mean, you know, if film scene opened tomorrow, we would have weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of just repertory film and classics, which is great. But, you know, I think 
people, a lot of people go to the movies because they want to see something new. There's nostalgia, but there's also that we, we go to movies for films we anticipate. So all the cinemas are kind of having to figure out what that means as far as programming, but also operations, obviously. Um, and in the interim, we've been having films uh, virtually on our website. You know, people can rent them for, you know, three days for $12 and 50% of that goes to the, the movie theaters but it pales in comparison. I mean, early on people were like, oh, the, all of these virtual films will ruin the, the people's interest in going to movies. But like, it's not even close. It is not a replacement. There is no, there's no danger of that because you know, people come to film scene because they love film scene. They love the popcorn, they love the staff, they love the big sound and the big picture um, and renting something on their couch, even in support of film scene just doesn't, doesn't hold a candle. Um, so, so we've been working to, to offer things virtually, you know, just because it's a source of an engagement and it's something to, to continue to do the work that we care about and that we do all the time, working towards that reopening date and figuring out what we'll be able to show audiences. Um, and that's what's happening across the country. Every single movie theater is doing that. At least the independents are, like the independent or house cinemas are really figuring out that virtual piece, whereas the larger chains don't really have that, um, that ability they're you know they don't they wouldn't normally show a film from kino lore but they wouldn't normally show beanpole the russian drama you know so they they're not putting that on their website whereas the independents have been a little bit more nimble and able to offer that curated programming that we normally would just in a virtual space so yeah that's a lot but <laughs> that's sort of been what we've been navigating and the, the big thing is everyone is waiting with bated breath uh, for the new christopher nolan film called tenet which is distributed by Warner Brothers. It's due to come out July 17th. Um, it's the only film on the calendar. The, it's the only film in the su early months of summer that has not moved. And the, the sort of thinking is that if, if Tenet stays put, everyone is building their reopening around that date, around July 17th. If Tenet moves, I think you're gonna, it, all, all of us will feel this, uh, another huge aftershock of all of this. Um, and supposedly there's going to be some news about it. Maybe by the time people watch this, there will be news. But um, so yeah, so mid July is sort of what people are working towards. But it's been an incredibly, um, you know, the rug was completely pulled out from under us, from under everybody in the yeah. in the exhibition world. So um, so Chris, help first of all um, uh, center viewers in in what kind of film you produce. And then where where you were in your project and kind of how that how this is uh, affecting you. Well, um, so I'm uh, what's most often described as an experimental filmmaker, although that definition can be vague and amorphous to many, if not most. So uh, the best way to talk about the kind of work I make is that you know I work like an artist. Um, I'm you know I'm not a person who directs films per se. I'm a person who makes them. Um, and that what that means is like a painter, a writer, poet. I work usually alone. Uh, I work in like a, a, like a studio artist and I, my, my work is most often seen in non-commercial contexts uh, in, you know, special screenings at film festivals and cinema techs at universities, museums, art galleries, and those kinds of contexts. So, um, and, uh, you know, they, there's work that's uh, deliberately challenging to the uh, conventions of commercial uh, cinema, the aesthetics of commercial cinema. So it's kind of like a, an insurgent kind of cinema, aesthetically, politically, and otherwise. Um, and there's this whole world of filmmaking like that. And there's a lot of filmmakers who cross over and blur boundaries between the larger commercial um, uh, industrial filmmaking world and the kind of work that I make. It's not, it's not a clear binary by any means. Um, and so what was the second part of your question? I, I, well, what, what are you working on now and how well, is that shifting? Okay. Uh, I, before I answer that, I just want to speak to, uh, in part, the impact on filmmakers of cancellations and closures, because you, you look at it from, it was interesting to hear Rebecca talk about it, but to look at it from the point of view of the makers, uh, you know, for filmmakers who work like I do, it's, it's no doubt quite different than what distributors and, uh, you know, of, uh, 
film production companies that are up against with the closures of uh, theaters. But there have been a lot of cancellations, a lot of filmmakers who were set to have their festival premieres of their new work. And their, uh, you know, I had um, screenings in Belgium, New York, and Des Moines um, scheduled for this spring that had to be canceled at the last minute. And you know, some of that had already been paid for. Um, some of it, they paid me anyway, even if it, though it was canceled. And so that kind of support of artists is deeply appreciated. I've, I've unexpectedly I, I experienced that kind of support from different venues, even uh, an exhibition in Cincinnati that wasn't scheduled until the fall. They have canceled the exhibit. Um, I think they said canceled or certainly postponed indefinitely, but they, they're going to pay us now what they agreed to pay us. So, you know, that, that, that's just really encouraging to have that kind of support from the different venues that, that show work, uh, like the kind of work that I make. But in terms of what I'm working on now, well, there's a couple of different projects. Um, and, and Rebecca and I will, I guess, have to touch base about one of them because there was a commission, I still don't know. I, and I'm sure Rebecca doesn't know the future of the, uh, it's the Refocus Film Festival, right? Yeah, yes. Film Scene is planning on launching the first year of the Refocus Film Festival in September, which is a film festival dedicated to the art of adaptation. But of course, I mean, as Chris is mentioning, so many festivals have been postponed or put on, on you know, put virtually uh, in lieu of an, an in-person festival. And of course, the Cannes Film Festival being the biggest one. But I mean, there was one in Iowa City, IC Docs, which Chris helmed, um, which, you know, the students that put that on completely pivoted to a virtual, you know, a virtual version. Uh, where something like, you know, Cannes Film Festival can't really do that, but there's, you know, smaller festivals that have been able to be really creative and put things, put things online virtually. I'm thrilled to hear that they're still paying you for, for some of your work. That's yeah. great. Right. And of course, not everyone has been able to pay. They've just postponed indefinitely or, you know, had a target dates in mind of when they'd like to do these events. But yeah, it's been great to have that kind of support. It's been unexpected and welcome. Uh, in terms of what I'm working on now, so, you know, there's uh, the, you know, commission, a couple of different commissions, one from the Wexner Center for the Arts and then one from Refocus Film Festival. The one, the, the project from Wexner Center, um, I will say it's, it was originally, you know, it, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do, but I think my thinking has been uh, sharpened by the current moment and I don't you know as I was saying before I don't want the work I'm making now to take on an undue burden of having to be you know so desperately topical so as to risk becoming dated you know very soon uh, in a few years so I mean I but what's you know I, I think what's important to think about is like the subject matters and the, my approach to filmmaking is one in which the, the things, the, the subjects I engage, they come back around in cycles anyway, and they, re, they reformulate, they bubble back up to the surface of consciousness in new and different ways all the time. And this pandemic is just another iteration of that. So for what I mean by that, for example, is, um, you know, I was thinking about, uh, you know, the way, there's a, there's a, 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 a list serve that I, uh, join that is all about it's called dreams under confinement and what it is is though is and I haven't looked at it closely but I, I'm thinking of drawing on that for this project what it is for the Wexner project what it is is um, just a just of, of people who are in prison describing their dreams mm. and but it, it's just interesting for me to think about because for the Wexner project you know there's all these parameters and and we were talking be, uh, before about creative limitations and um, that's really apropos from uh, people who work along like a, like a studio artist making films because the work is generated out of like really limited means and, and what you have at hand and so um, you know the Wexner Commission is uh, all about tying the work it's like the parameters on it has to be two minutes or less uh it has to be geographically situated like a specific 
place in a geographical place has to be explicit about where it is, when it's taking place, and it, it, it needs to speak to the current moment. And I think my task is to like do it end around those parameters and speak to the current moment in a way that extends beyond that current moment. And that draws on and references history leading up to that current moment. Because I don't like to make work that isolates, you know, the current moment from history or vice versa. And so, you know, this is my thinking has been sharpened. I was really going to make a totally different project, but it was always going to be about Chicago in some way. I was thinking about Chicago for this project. I don't know why I lived there for a long time, but I don't know why I immediately went to Chicago as the region for me to work in. I think part of me is still there. I think that's why, as I was saying earlier. Uh, so I'm thinking about Cook County um, Jail as the geographical site, dreams under confinement, but also connecting those dreams to perhaps, and I, this is where it's uh, not been worked out, but connecting those dreams perhaps to large, you know, the context of the pandemic and how, you know, the, so, you know, there's been all this uh, writing recently, very recently about how people's dreams are being mm -hmm. uh, affected by having to be, you know, staying inside so much and, and confinement. I don't want to equate those two types of confinement, but I think there's an interesting relationship between mm -hmm. them. And what I, what I guess, I guess what I'm gesturing towards is not forgetting the, the people who are under a, a very different kind of confinement and also thinking about like, how specifically, without necessarily explicitly referencing, how specifically, you know, jails have become yet another, uh, you know, uh, breeding ground for this uh, pandemic to spread. And so, um, that's just what I'm thinking about. I can't tell you what, but 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 again, the the I'm reacting to the current moment, but in a way that I'm trying to open it up and not make a strictly topical kind of journalistic approach. Mm -hmm. To the current moment. And then I have another longer ongoing project that was funded in 2015 by Creative Capital. And uh, that project, I'm going to, um, it's an archival film project. I'm going to move my studio into my home office. And I'm on a fellowship next year. So that means I won't be teaching. And I have the whole summer and then all of next academic year and into the following summer to focus full time on this work. And what it's again this is what i mean by these things they come and go they come they cycle back around this film was in part a response to it's about a lot of things my sort of uh tagline is that it's about uh black ecstasy and the forces arrayed against it but that means a lot and that's embodied in a lot of different ways that we don't have time for me to break down here but very quickly one of the things I was interested in, it was responding in this film to Ishmael Reed's novel, Mumbo Jumbo, which is about, in the book, what he calls, his book is published in 1972, and it's set in the jazz age. And in the book, he talks about uh, this, uh, he, he, he has this uh, entity called Jess Grew, which he describes as an antivirus. And so it's interesting, again, that that's a major theme in the work that I'm making right now. And then you have this virus and there's all these connections because um, the relationship between, you know, for example, um, um, you know, um, so for example, there's been a lot of attention paid to the fact that there are so much, so many racial disparities in um, the healthcare industry and how uh, people of color, particularly black and brown people, are, are, are severely uh, impacted and overrepresented and, and, and more severely impacted than uh, mainstream community white people uh, by COVID-19. And so there's that layer that gets put on the reading of the work I'm doing now. And I have to think about a way to gesture towards that without making a film about COVID-19 because mm -hmm. that was never the intention. And I'm looking at a much longer historical arc. But again, this is how, you know, this, come, this comes right, this comes back and cycles around in a new way. These are ongoing right. uh, matters that have a whole history behind them. So I know it's a really, really long <laughs> answer, but you know, that's the, that's the short answer from, yeah. from, from uh, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, it, well, that your last part makes me wonder if um, either there are examples from like films that were in starting to be in production or moving toward production um, that 
you're maybe hearing any noise that they're going to shift the storyline at all and or examples of when that's been done in the past you know when there's been a a, a big world moment oh I, I don't really know i mean i'm sure there are lots of examples of that you know but I, you know you hear about films that like were about to be released and something happens and then they get held. I'm, I bet Rebecca could probably think of specific examples, maybe. Oh, sure. I just put oh, you yeah. on the spot, huh? No, it's okay. <laughs> no, okay. I mean, I do know that um, it's interesting when we closed film scene, one of the first films that we put on a virtual, a virtual viewing page was a film called uh, The Wild Goose Lake, which was actually set in, it's, it's a Chinese film, it's set in Wuhan, which is just sort of a weird, like, and it's a film that's been done, you know, and it's not about a, it's illness or anything, but it was just very interesting that it was like, you know, I had never even heard of Wuhan, China, really, and then suddenly it was in the news, and then there was this film. Um, there, there is a film that I can't, the name escapes me, that um, is, was being filmed that was about, uh, it's another Chinese production that was about a, a, a disease that was kind of running rampant. I can't remember it. Maybe I can Google it and see. Um, but, you know, as far as film shifting, I mean, I think I'm hearing more anecdotally films, uh, independent filmmakers that are shifting the, any films they're making right now. Like similar, I, I was talking about how my husband is uh, the program head at the Harold Ramis Film School here in Chicago. And these are students who are, are working, you know, primarily collaboratively in an ensemble. They're making like comedy, short comedy films. And they're, all of their productions were completely scrapped. So he's been really encouraging them to use use the quarantine you know use your roommate or use yourself or use that your space to tell your story in a way like how can you make something with just yourself in your apartment and how can that still be the story you wanted to tell or, or maybe you scrap the story you were going to tell and it becomes something new he and i actually are i mean he's a he's a filmmaker too and we have really loud upstairs neighbors so we're making like a short film about being stuck in, in an apartment with you know i mean that's just for us something for us to do but um but, you know, I think I'm very curious to see what films will come out of this, whether they are large productions, you know, I mean, there are huge productions, Spider-Man, Mission Impossible, you know, will they, will there be, not to use the word strains, but will there be strains of coronavirus when they reopen? Will, will something make its way in, um, you know, or will there be lots of independent projects that are directly inspired by, by COVID-19? I'm not sure. And I think about all the films from the past that are about disease without being about disease. So, you know, like It Follows was a horror film from a couple of years ago, which is, you know, very like clearly about STDs. Um, the, what Wesley Snipes Blade film is about vampires, but it's clearly about, you know, I, I, some people argue it's about AIDS or it's about, you know, people being sort of um, ostracized because of sickness. Um, you know, the, it, it, just different films that are have been about something else, but they're really also about the the prejudices and the disparities and the um, real uh, blight that comes from from sickness. Um, so I, I'm sure we will be seeing strains of that. And also, I mean, when when film scene first closed, you know, we and we thought we were going to reopen in a week. We were like, oh, we got to show Mad Max, and we got to show Outbreak, and we've got to show Contagion. Like oh, it'll be really yeah. funny. We'll like lean into it. I don't know that we would do that now when we reopen, but you know, there's just so many, I mean, my husband and I watched Contagion like, you know, week one, cause we were sort of like, oh, you know, this is sort of like what's going on right now. You know, now it doesn't seem so, so sort of like ch cheeky and, and yeah. glib, but um, so I'm, I'm sure that from small productions to that people are making in their homes to, um, to big productions, we'll see, we'll see it. And we might not even realize that we're seeing it, but we'll see it. And there, the, you know, there's been that great article, I think it was in New York recently about Todd Haynes' film, Safe. Mm -hmm. Connecting Absolutely. that to the current moment and the AIDS crisis, yeah. like just, but globally. And this is what I mean by how like, that's a film in which all those things are already embedded in it. You don't really have to make a film that's explicitly mm -hmm. about COVID-19 for it to be about that and also lots of other things related to that you know mm -hmm. so yeah that was also, that was also a rewatch like in week two for me say <laughs> <laughs> i also wanted to take us back to our earlier conversation before we started recording about um how this moment is so different from other um you know big uh kind of difficult shared community moments such as after 9 11 
with the in terms of the role of films um do you want to start yeah. okay yeah i mean i as a movie lover and a film film studies graduate and a film programmer i mean movies are my comfort and going to the movie theaters is a sense of like normalcy and routine that i really rely on and in history, um, movie going has, I mean, wo world wars, 9-11, um, um, you know, really tragic events that we've experienced internationally and domestically, like the movie theaters have been the places, maybe, you know, 9-11, we were talking like, you know, it, I think, especially in New York, theaters were closed for a short time, but, you know, they, they didn't really close across the country, especially in, mid in the Midwest and middle America. And, um, and a lot of people went to movies right away because it was a sense of something that they, they knew that they, they could understand. You know, you can understand the movie theater, you can go there, you can be with your friends, you can cry, you can laugh. Um, and and so, my, man, so many movies came out of, came out of that um, experience. But this is, this is a really sinister experience because the, you know, it, when, when you need people and you need entertainment and culture and arts the most, those are the things that you decidedly can't have and and even when we reopen as a country or as a community or as a movie theater you know we're talking about how to how to have limited seating and how to have this checkerboard situation so you you, you know you're sitting far away from people i mean it's like we're going to actually have we're going to have to implement rules where you literally can't sit close to people and you know you know if you see a comedy and you see a comedy with three people in the theater, you know, it's still funny, but if you see a comedy with 120 people in the theater, it's way funnier or it's way scarier or it's way sadder or it's way more romantic because you feel that collective breath or, you know, that collective response. So I'm, I'm very, um, very, not, I don't know, concerned. I mean, obviously I'm concerned, but I'm, I'm sort of like weep for the future of movie, movie going because I think for a number of months, if not years, there's going to be a, 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 um, a, a cautiousness that you, you don't want to have. You want people to like give, give in to the movie and give in to that collective experience. And I think we're going to have to be too cautious and we're going to have to be safe. And I, I'm pro safety and pro science, but I'm also very pro movie, movie going. And I think it's going to really take a hit and it's going to be really hard. And, and there's, there's so many people that live in that world where they don't, they barely go to the movies. And I think a lot of people will, that'll just be something that they excise from their life. Um, and that's, that's a real bummer. I mean, it's a real, to put it lightly, it's a real bummer. There's a great book um, called The Perils of Movie Going. Oh gosh, it's like 18 something to 1950s. Uh, it's about a guy named Gary Rhodes. And it's about, you know, movie theaters being kind of like rickety old systems, you know, and celluloid was very flammable. And it's about fires and, you know, all the things that people experienced when they were going to the movies, when movie, movie houses were new. And, you know, there has, I don't think he's made a second one, but from since the 1950s to 2020, a lot has happened, you know, sh shootings in movie theaters and now sickness and, and it's hard. I mean, the movie theaters are going to have to respond um, as best they can. Um, but I, I do think it will be a really, really uphill battle and a, a challenging road. On the other, too much of a downer. <laughs> well, on the other hand, I don't know. I have no, uh, empirical evidence of this obviously and I haven't done any scientific studies but you know and maybe and of course everyone's uh, social media contact group is a very selective uh, subset of the general population but I, I get a sense I, I guess I'm most interested in um, uh, sort of in, um, uh, optimistic about younger people for some reason I get the sense that they realize that there's like a belatedness of like oh yeah the real world is valuable like you know there, there's this like strain of like oh you know everybody's living in their phones blah 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 and how you know that's just the way we are now and we don't really want to be with people anymore like this is the discourse before the pandemic and now when you see that sort of enforced reality we realize we always wanted that just as an option not as a way of life and i think yeah it's kind of encouraging to some extent. Again, I, I do have a, like I do teach in a film, a cinematic arts department. So the young people I'm seeing and thinking about or the young people in my social media stream are more inclined to be people who want to go back into the cinemas. But it feels like to me from that really limited subjective perspective that young people are really embracing the value uh, of 
face to face and being present with someone. And the cinema is part of that, I think. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I hear you, Rebecca, but I also feel uh, something bubbling under too. Yes, maybe I shouldn't be that. Maybe the film programmer shouldn't be the most <laughs> pessimistic person. I guess I, I less pessimistic and just more like realistic. Like I yeah. see, I see the challenge on the horizon, yeah. knowing that especially the independent cinemas, we will meet that challenge. And and to your point, Chris, there was a a recent Hollywood Reporter did a recent survey and they, you know, asked people when they're going to be wanting to go back to the movies. And of course it was the 18 to like 37 year olds that were the, they were like, yep, whatever the theater does to make it safe, like I will be returning to the movies. So, um, so I, I do feel that, and you know, and I will say I am an incredibly like introverted person and I need my battery recharged like in a pretty major way after I interact with people a long time. So I, you know, early on I was kind of like, this may be for me, like, you know, <laughs> but then like week two, I was like, no, I need people. Like I realized how much I need people. And that was a nice realization. And I think that, you know, the, the, we're all sort of whirling dervishes and, and the inertia can keep us going in this certain direction. And yeah. I think the silver lining to this is we've sort of re reprioritized what we need. And I think cinemas and, and, going out to dinner and, and experiencing each other is a, is a big, big part of that, that I think a lot of people are realizing are, are is what makes us human. Well, and I'm laughing because I'm a big introvert too. It took me till probably week three to get there, but, um, and, and then everything I wanted to do were things that you do in public, but alone. I was like, yeah. I want to go to a movie. I want to go to a coffee shop. And right. Walk, you know? it was like... but, but you want to, but you want proximity to others, yeah. even if you don't really interact exactly. with them. Exactly. Because here's the thing, I, I'm the same as both yeah. of you. I, I, I'm a, I'm a weird, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I guess I'm at heart an extrovert, but I'm an introvert extrovert in that, like, I, I'm either all on or I want to be in a room alone with the door locked and music playing in a book and like nobody you know, I, I get my eyes rolled if I get a text or a phone call. I was like, because my sanctuary has been interrupted. It's like, I just have an on and off switch. I don't really have an in-between. But when I need my battery recharged, I need it recharged, like Rebecca was saying. So, uh, yeah, no, I can, I, I can feel you both. But it's weird that you want the possibility of a social mm -hmm. interaction mm -hmm. if you don't actually want the definite social like because yeah. you, so you, you might run into somebody who's really fun and interesting to talk to and you're open to that right but you but you're really okay if you that doesn't happen too right. yeah right. so that's what you know that what you were saying jennifer about being in the coffee shop or yeah. movie. like those are my favorite places too i'm a cafe person and a movie theater bookstore art gallery you know really solitary but public experience like that's me that's how i mm -hmm. yeah even a jazz club a nightclub where you go to hear the music right i don't go to chatter i just want to hear the vibe. Right. so yeah that's me i'm not what i am not is a uh like a nightclub or like yeah. a, oh no no, no. Go, i like to dance and everything in this in this spot but i'm not like even in my 20s i was never like that i didn't want to be not like, waiting for the summer festival you know the the raves to come back no <laughs> no god no i was never well, i never I, was waiting for that well because so that was I wanna, fun for like 30 minutes and then i wanted to go home yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i hear you anyway I hear you. So. so i want to i want to end us even though this is utterly delightful and I'm going to put you each on the spot. What is something that you have watched recently that gave you pleasure, that gave you uplift? Oh, wow. Oh. Um, we've, we've been watching movies every night. I mean, which has been great. I feel Jack, my husband was like, I feel like you're going back to film school. You're like rewatching everything you, you've watched. You haven't watched for years. And, but we have been watching a lot of musicals, which it, I mean, I had seen, I, I'd watched a lot of musicals as a kid, but we're sort of discovering, not necessarily deep cuts, but deep cuts for us. And there's a film with Fred Astaire and Sid Charisse called The Bandwagon. Mm. And it is so delightful. It, you know, it's, that's entertainment is the song. That's one of the most famous songs from, that comes from it. But it is just truly, I mean, we've gone back and rewatched just scenes from it on YouTube just in the middle of the day. Cause I'm like, I gotta watch that scene where they dance in Central Park, or I gotta watch that scene when, there's this really famous scene where Sid Charisse takes off this fur coat in a jazz club and sort of slinks over to Fred Astaire, who was, you know, like 60 something when he filmed it. So I would say exploring those like old musicals, you can't not smile when someone is as talented as dancing on the big, on the screen in front of you. And uh, you may see some musicals uh, on film scene screen when reopened just due to the like 
sheer number of musicals that I've been watching. <laughs> Some of them are, the, the, sometimes the storylines are pretty thin. But, uh, you know, it's usually guy meets girl. There's some sort of, like, misunderstanding, and then they dance a lot, and then they fall in love. But it's really great. And we've also been watching, I mean, like, old war movies and lots of Hitchcock and, you know, a lot of movies from the 80s to see if they still hold up from my childhood. So it's but, – but the bandwagon is great. Okay, I'll watch it. So my answer would be, it's really, God, that it does put me on the spot because my viewing is so scattershot. It's all over the place. I mean, from like, we I actually did watch with my oldest uh, the entire Mad Max series in order since this started. <laughs> he really wanted to see them and, and he had never seen them. And I, I just sort of, I, it was, it's fun to re-experience a film with one of your kids and take them through the whole series. I, actually doing that with my youngest with, um, uh, another, well, I guess, I'm trying to think what, what we, we watched. I can't remember what it was that we watched together not long ago, but to answer your question. So the one, I guess one film that I've really been inspired by is Carl Smith, who's a filmmaker, but who's become more of a visual artist who makes films in recent years. Colin Smith's made a film called Sojourner. It's a short film that we programmed at the Iowa City International Documentary Film Festival that streamed online, but I had seen it a couple of times before that, once in Toronto at the Images Festival, and then again in uh, Brazil, the Belo Horizonte uh, 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 Short Film Festival. And, um, and I watched it again um, at IC Docs, and it just stays with me. It's a beautiful, lovely film. It's all about community and sisterhood. It's a short film. It's a sort of an essay-ish film. It, it, combines references to John Coltrane, Alice Coltrane, Sun Ra, um, the Kohambi River Collective, which is a group of uh, a womanist, uh, <laughs> uh, black womanist uh, uh, um, uh, uh, thinkers and intellectuals. Uh, um, the, the Watts Towers uh, in, in California, uh, <laughs> The um, uh, I'm, I'm I'm blanking on the. On and it's a the, short. That's incredible. It's a short. Like it, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a crazy. It, it, it has all this these things. It's a beautiful, lovely film. Yeah. It's almost beyond description. You have to kind of see it, you know. Is but it it's really Chris? Um, well, you can't. I you know I'll I'll talk to Colleen and and, and I'm sure she would be amenable to me sharing it with the two of you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm but, just wondering about putting a link. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk to her. Yeah, okay. that would be great. Yeah, okay. but um, it's called Sojourner by Colleen okay. Smith. If you Google it, you can read about okay. it. It's a beautiful, lovely film. Right. It just has a beautiful uh, uh, visual yeah. color palette as well. And it's just, I, yeah, it's, it's a film that, that I love quite a bit. And it's, uh, you talk about being uplifting. It's very uplifting. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you both so much. It was, I can't wait to see you. I know. I yeah. can't wait to see you and... It'd be nice to get together one day. Yes, yeah. yes, we will. We will. For, it will happen in some capacity. It will happen. And, and I think everyone's going to just have to hold themselves back from attacking each other with right, right, right. all that. That's going to be the hard thing. Right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.